Ladies and gentlemen, we begin our session for the day is on how good monitor mixing can boost a performance. And for that, I have Mr. Ashish Saxena. Ashish Saxena. Uh, the gentleman here is the live sound engineer for Shankar Esan Loy and also the owner and chief sound engineer of Purple Hay Studio. He has been in the industry for over 30 decades now and he has worked on many prestigious pro pro projects with music directors like Vishal Shekhar, Louis Banks, Ram Sampat, Ranjit Barrett and he also does live concerts for KK Ayushman Khurana, Shankar Esan Loy. Can we please uh, I request you to take the stage and go ahead? Yes, thank you. Hi, morning guys. Uh, I'm a little nervous, I don't do this very often. Okay, as you know, I can't even. Uh, Hindi, English, Hindi better? English, mix. So this is going to be a basically a monitor mixing primer. It's not like going to be one advanced thing because So this is just going to be a primer and then we'll do question and answers. You guys can ask me. So basically the difference between monitor mixing and front of house mixing is the creative aspect of the mixing. Monitor mixing is more technical and front of house mixing is more creative where you only have one which is the audience, which is the crowd there. And I would say partially for yourself also, because you like, so you're mixing. But monitor mixing is more technical. You're not mixing just for yourself. You're mixing for all the musicians on stage, the singers and everybody. And also what happens is depending on the number of musicians and the singers, you're creating that many more mixes. So if there are five musicians, two singers, then you're making seven mixes. So it becomes more technical. Also, you have to, you know, take care of feedback. You have to take care of individual kya preferences. Hai. You have to see ki nahi achha, idhar se boom ho hai, ki nahi ho hai, sharpness zada hai, ki nahi hai. So monitor mixing becomes more technical than front of house. So we'll go back to basics and uh, I would like to start with maybe trying to position the musicians a little better. So basically managing musicians on stage, uh, like I would say a very basic thing ki sitar wale ko drum wale ke saath mat rakho. Definitely problem hoigi hoigi. So it's better to create a more, uh, like a more defined thing where you would like to keep say the rhythm, the percussion guys uh, together, the melody and the uh, other guys together. So this is a very simple setup. I mix for KK. I actually for KK I do both front of house and monitors. So unlo ka bahut hi simple setup hai. Four jan hai. Guitar hai, keyboard hai, bass hai, drums hai. Bas. So bahut hi clean, bahut hi clean setup hai. As compared to uh, Shankar Sanlo, which has got like eight musicians on stage, three singers, sometimes four singers. So uh, what we can do when we are doing these things on stage is also we can use certain baffles, certain barriers to create a better separation so that there's not too much leakage uh, in this thing. So I would like to show you some of those. So this is like a baffle around congas. So, and this is, this goes two ways. This goes into preventing leakage, ki congas ka sound bahar na hai, and also that the conga mics don't pick up. So in case the congas are right next to the drums or the dholes or something like that, uh, the sound doesn't leak into it. Uh, say like a baffle around your guitar amp. As we all know, guitarists love to be the loudest guys on stage. So we can create like a baffle around them. So, you know, so we can lower the volume. Uh, the mics will obviously go inside the baffle and not outside. So that I'm sure you guys know that. Uh, so like this, we did like a full drum cage once uh, for the drums. Uh, this was more like an indoor space. So we did it. This was the only problem. I have cropped this photo. And KK and all started hanging towels on the, <laughs> on the back. <laughs> so it became a little weird. But this sort of protects the singer. If the singer's mic has moved here, the cymbal splashes don't come in. Because 
Uh, how many of you mix on a regular basis? Any of you? 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 So you all must, you must be knowing ki kitna difficult ho jata hai the moment the singer moves the mic away from his body. Okay, I don't know what, this is some random picture of him, sorry. Okay, so basically next uh, slide I will show you how uh, we took SEL and uh, uh, how they are actually placed on stage and how we wanted to so that we could separate the two. So this is like the old layout. As you can see, we have the percussion, drums, dolak dhol, all in a line at the back. So the percussion guys are at the back. And then we have the melody section in front, which is bass, guitar, keyboards. But as you can see, it's, and keyboards in front, but as you can see, it's nice, but it's like a, you know, a little bit of a messy thing on stage. So what we tried to do, we tried to do a new layout where we put drums and dholes and dholak and percussion. So drums and dholes to, together, which are like the loudest thing. So we put them together and dholak and percussions there. And then we nicely placed all the melody section guys in front with the saxophone guy. Uh, case in point, they didn't go for it. They were like, nay, sorry. But this is what we tried to do with them. And now we'll come to IEMs and setups, uh, which I think is very important. And correct antenna placement, uh, correct placement of the belt packs, uh, those things are very, very important. Uh, interference with, uh, with an LED screen, because as we all know, most of the LED screens come from China and they're not really RF compliant as such, and there's a lot of leakage. So the antennas and all have to be like sort of placed away from the screens. Uh, basically, we use these fish antennas. Uh, I don't know, I think they're called dipole or unipole or whatever. But these, I think, are the more prevalent antennas that are used in the industry. And I would suggest that whoever is a sound vendor, they should buy these and replace those little stick antennas. Uh, for one thing, because one, you can say combine four or eight units together and have them run, running off one antenna, instead of having, you know, eight different, different, uh, you know, dundies, which could interfere with each other also for all you know. This particular thing is, uh, is actually more for an in-ear thing and it's a more, it's like a football antenna and it's meant more for a wider dispersion of RF uh, coming in. This, uh, this actually is very uh, popular with, for IEMs again. And this beams a more, more uh, stronger uh, signal, so to speak. Uh, one thing I would like to say is also don't place IEM and mic systems together because one is transmitting, one is receiving, and they're definitely going to you know, cancel each other. Uh, give you an example of the distances. So as I'm saying, uh, if you have an IEM and a mic, never place the IEM uh, antenna behind the mic antenna, because the mic antennas are normally more stronger uh, in their RF. So always put the IEM antenna in front of uh, the mic antenna. And we actually have, we've had an experience with this a uh, couple of times where uh, because of tightness of space, we actually ended up putting uh, the IEM antenna behind and we actually, we did get dropout. So uh, I have practically experienced this. Normally they say that between the receiving and the transmitting antennas, there should be around six feet. Uh, I think around three feet, three feet to two feet is also good enough. This is actually textbook. So it's, uh, and then if you're using the short antennas, you need to have at least six inch spaces between the units. Uh, don't stack them up like this. I always see people stack up like this because of, uh, you know, lack of space. But this actually interferes a lot. Uh, the antennas themselves get all bungled up. So in this, like, uh, we are not doing antennas, uh, small antennas. We're actually doing proper antennas. I don't know if you guys can see on top. But what we've done is we've separated the mic and the IEMs. Uh, we've created a little bit of a, like around six to eight inches gap between them. 
And the antennas are actually placed very far, like one antenna is in that corner and, and one antenna is in this corner so that uh, it doesn't interfere uh, at all with uh, the receiving and transmitting. We'll touch a little bit upon monitors, monitor wedges, and placement, angling. OK, let's do that. So monitor wedges, I think mostly for we use a lot of monitor wedges, uh, especially in the front. I mean, now I think it's more IEMs have come in. But at the same time, it's still like I use monitor wedges now as uh, safety as more as a backup rather than uh, as an actual use. But I think a lot of other musicians, they, I think, still prefer using a lot of monitor wedges. So sorry. So it's very, it's good for you to be able to control those monitor wedges, make sure what kind of mixes, what kind of mixes you, you build up on those monitor wedges. They will also help you. And always keep the low end out of those monitor wedges. Don't put too much low end in them. Uh, if you want to get more efficiency out of it, you have to see what kind of uh, a mic the singer is using. And accordingly, you have to angle uh, the wedges. So basically, this is wrong. Don't, I mean, it's, I would say it's subjectively wrong, not always wrong, but subject, subjectively wrong. Because you, if you have this in a straight line and it's doing its uh, 60 degree uh, dispersion, and uh, the mic is in the middle, then it's, uh, it's going to leak into the mic. The wedge is going to badly leak into the mic. So what you actually need to do is you need to angle them. So like here, like how we've angled those to the singer. When, so when the singer stands in the middle, it, the angle becomes like a null point for his mic. So the possibility of feedback uh, sort of reduces. But this, again, I would say is only true for certain patterns of mic. Like this is good for like maybe a super cardioid, but it's not really good for uh, like a cardioid mic or a, or a hyper. Okay, random monitors, sorry. Huh. So as you can see, I'm talking about the dispersion, it's around 45 degrees by 60 degrees. So monitor wedges are actually quite tight. And I would say it's actually difficult to get a monitor wedge to go into feedback. So all, all the cases or most of the cases that I have seen where the monitors are going to feedback are maybe that the monitors have not been rung out correctly. Uh, the monitors are angled wrongly or the monitors are, have been sort of t made too loud by the musician asking for more and more gain on the monitor, which is physically not possible because as we all know that there's a little bit of physics involved here and after some time a loop sort of forms. Like even if I talk too loudly into this mic, after some time it'll start interacting with the speaker and go into like a feedback loop. So that's like physics. So we, we all know that after a certain point, even a monitor is going to sort of start crashing and trembling and a, f a lot of feedback will happen. So basically, the, uh, coming back to my earlier point where about the kind of microphones that the singers use. So for, as you can see here, so for a cardioid mic, it's OK to put the monitor. Because as you can see from the pattern, the null point of the mic is right at the back. So in this, in this uh, kind of a situation where uh, I would like uh, SM58 is a cardioid mic. So if the singer is singing on an SM58, or even if he's using, uh, say, a wireless, uh, but with a 58 capsule, it's OK to put the monitor uh, flat like this back to. But if you if if the if the singer is using a beta 58, which is a super cardioid, I mean it says hyper, but even uh, super is like this with a little uh, thing at the back, or even a cordless mic with a beta 58 capsule, then it's better to angle the monitors so that they again go into the null point. Clear so far? Anybody? I'm maybe I'm going too fast. I am no. I don't do this very often, I'm sorry, guys. 
So another example of, so when you're holding the cardioid mic, uh, when the singer, if the singer is doing this and all, then of course it's going to interact. Like now I'm now talking about textbook, not practical situations. Singers do tend to uh, raise their mic or put their hands down, which is the worst, you should slap them. <laughs> so, uh, so this is basically, as you can see in the cardioid pattern, the null point of where the mic is and how the wedge, wedge sort of interacts with it. And in a super cardioid, how the null point is on the sides, at the back of the mic, but on the sides, and how a monitor will uh, interact with that. So again, as you can see, we've, uh, he was using a, this was a Sennheiser 5235, which is actually a very uh, flexible capsule. It changes from hypercardioid to supercardioid depending on the uh, sort of the proximity uh, to the mic. And uh, so angled wedges work very well, very well with him. Uh, so basically, uh, Oh, I have some pointers to give you all. Okay, fine. <laughs> so what you can do is you can, uh, before, uh, before you start doing the sound check, you can actually run a little pink uh, through your wedges. You can maybe put up an RTA mic. I know we all use RTA mic only for front of house, but you can do this also. You can actually put up uh, RTA mic next to the wedges, run some pink, and maybe on the graphic or on the parametric, you can maybe uh, flatten out uh, the peaks. I would say don't bring up, uh, you know, the, the troughs, which is the down part, but anything which is like peaking, you can bring it down and don't do more than three and four. If you want to do more than three and four, I would suggest using a parametric EQ more than a, more the, rather than a graphic EQ. So what happens is the moment you sort of flatten uh, the wedge, it will automatically be able to give you a little more volume rather than if things were peaking. So if you had like say a wedge, for example, which has a nice high mid, like I think most of the JBL wedges have a nice high mid uh, punch to them. And the moment you put like say a high mid thing like a guitar or a singer who, who sings in the upper registers, it automatically starts peaking and ringing and like because like a bell, bell sort of forms also in this. So it's very good if you sort of RTA uh, the monitor and sort of, you know, reduce uh, the peaks a little bit and flatten it out a little bit. And of course, the second thing is to make sure that the positioning of the monitors are correct. Sorry, random foot. <laughs> so we'll come to headphones and IEMs and one thing we all miss is uh, impedance matching between IEM systems and Sennheiser systems. Uh, mo most of the times musicians go and buy like the cheapest headphone that they can find some 200, 500, 1000 rupee thing. And it may have low impedance, but unfortunately it actually has such low impedance that it can actually just give up uh, when it is connected to a pro system like a Shure IEM system or a Sennheiser IEM system which is outputting actually at a much like a line level, uh, you know, kind of a output. And all these, uh, what are some brands of those cat, whatever, I don't know, I don't even remember all these weird uh, hi-fi brands. They just tend to blow on the spot. Or, or the second thing what happens is that those headphones start saturating so much that they turn to mush, means uske andar itna, uski jaani nikal jati hai. So, what happens is the musician is not able to hear his mix correctly. And then he'll keep asking you to keep increasing the gain. Nay, nay, meko sunai nai de rai, aur badao, sunai nai de rai, aur badao. But that is all happening because uh, it's all turning into mush in his ears. He is not able to distinguish individual instruments. He is not able to distinguish his own instrument. And it's actually overloaded so much that it's saturating so badly in his ears. So that is why I try and explain to the musicians that I work with that it's not a good practice to buy these, because these cheap things may sound very good with your mobile phones when you're listening to music and all, but when you come on stage and you're in a very high volume situation where there may be drums behind you and dholes playing this side and then to have these, you know, headphones which 
may just snap at any time is definitely not a so and also it's your profession so be a little more responsible towards it spend a little money and buy something good you know which will last you longer and help you perform better so in this impedance plays a very big part as uh, for me that is what i have noticed uh, over the last so many years that i've been mixing uh, and i'm okay to give i'm, I'm not uh, i'm okay to give examples like sure uh, iems which are very, of very high impedance like they are around 32 to 40 uh, ohms don't work very well with the sanizer because the sanizers are iems i think around 18 24 i think i have it written somewhere so what happens is because of the higher iem the impedance uh, you need to send more output to uh, to his headphone and also because the impedance doesn't match and anyway as you all know that iems not, don't really transmit like the full frequency of uh, sound uh, it's it's on the fm band so it's actually very narrow i think it just goes up to 12k and like maybe down to i practically i would say not even 100 like not nothing below 100 hertz and also the panning is not really very wide like if, if you do like a full uh, pan it actually just shows up like a uh, three by you know uh, uh, by nine kind of a situation in a in a in here. So even if you pan something, it doesn't really pan too well. Uh, basically, that's because of the compounding effect where they are compounding and you know expanding again the information. So they tend to throw away a lot of extra which they think, nahi, nahi, to iski to zarurat nahi hai. That's why wired IEMs are much better for static musicians. If you have keyboard players who are standing in one place, like drummers are standing in one place, or whole guys, it's better to give them wired IEMs rather than to give them wireless IEMs. Okay, so coming back to impedance, a higher impedance definitely means like a clearer balance, maybe lesser volume, and a lower impedance. But low impedance, I would say like uh, those hi-fi headphones, like which are down to eight ohms and you know six ohms and whatever, are not really very good. I used to remember what this was, but now I don't anymore. <laughs> uh, the other thing I do uh, when I'm mixing monitors is I also mix, I also match uh, my console output uh, to the in-ear input. So if if I set up my, uh, if I see, if I send say pink or say, I would actually send a sign tone, not pink, uh, because I would like a more, uh, you know, definite tone. And if I set it to minus 10 uh, on my console, then I set it to minus, uh, I make sure that I adjust the sensitivity on the IEM and I set it to minus 10. Now, this has no technical, uh, you know, thing of like minus 10 and plus 4 and analog versus digital. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just that I need to see a graphic representation of what I am sending and how it is going on to the IEM. So if I am hitting our till zero, but I'm not clipping, I know that the, that IEM is not going to clip. So it's basically like a remote reference of what that IEM is doing because most of the times you will not be next to the IEMs. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of you will start up mixing front of house and monitors together. Uh, and the IEMs will be on stage and you will be like, say, 70 meters away and you're not going to do that. So that's the first thing I do. And of course, you can take help of uh, whoever the sound you know person there and make sure your levels are matched after a few shows when you make up your show file and you're getting the same equipment then you you will automatically be fall into a pattern and it'll be fine for you okay so importance of custom uh, in ears for artists as opposed to generic uh, in ears, uh, as we all know, that generic in ears, they just come in like say maybe three sizes: small, medium, large, and that's like a fit for all all ears and everything. But custom is actually something which is designed uh, specifically for you by giving for you by you making an ear impression and then sending it uh, to that particular company, and then they custom make a earpiece for you so that it fits much better and we right now we don't have too many uh, companies here in india doing it but most of my 
uh, top artists are have already have made custom inhers for them and they vouch by it and they say ki, yes definitely things have improved a lot because there's less leakage of sound uh, the wearability is much better it's more comfortable for them because it's designed for their ear uh, so definitely these are the pluses for having a custom uh, and these are like the generic i think everybody knows 535s they are the more very very popular uh, pro headphones used by quite a lot of uh, and i actually don't recommend them because we most of the vendors across the country use sennheiser in ear systems and these actually don't respond too well to those okay this is obvious can't wear it like that and same thing with the sennheiser i did So we'll come to mixing. Any questions so far? Anything you guys want to ask me? Put sakte hain kaise kuch tension nahi hai. Darne ka nahi. Any question is a good question. Sir, you said that uh, in in years you uh, calibrate through sending sine wave, right? Uh, so, any particular frequency sine waves or all the spectrum? 1K. 1K. Yeah, thank you, sir. And the reason why I send a sine wave and not pink noise is because I am not trying to gauge, I am not trying to do a frequency evaluation of, I am just setting levels, that's it. And in those circumstances, you will find that a sine wave is more definite and more, uh, you know, like a proper tone to just set your levels. Pink noise me kya hoega? If you actually have better meters, you will see them flickering a little bit up and down. You know, you will see them flickering up and down. All good so far. How are you doing on time? I think I'm going very fast. Oh, I mean, okay, sure. But okay, so we'll come to mixing and. Uh, these are all my personal viewpoints. Aplo ke ala goenge, so aisa kuch hai nahi. To a certain extent, except for the physics part of it, sound is subjective. What works for you works for you. What works for me works for me. It's fine. Like people mic hi hats from below. It works for them. I don't. It works for me. So there's no hard and fast rule. So uh, for in ears, basically always set up. Uh, basic mix before you hand it over to a particular musician or a singer because nobody likes to put headphones on and have nothing. It's like, sorry, first of all, it's them blocked out uh, of their environment. And also it gives them a very good chance to take one year out because, Are, mereko, you know, surrounding a good sunai nahi hai. So that is, of course, we'll come to that. So. Uh, always give, always set up like a small, rough, basic mix. So when they pop their headphones in, they can hear something happening. Like nobody likes hearing, okay, kick, kick. Five minutes a kick chal rahe. You know, nobody likes that. Just those in there. So always set up like a rough balance before, and I will come to how to uh, set up a rough balance. Okay, now this section unfortunately was a practical section, uh, but we don't have a console here. Okay, just uh, just give me one sec. Uh, who's handling this? How do I scroll down? If I want to scroll, how do I scroll down? How do I scroll 
你敢行I can go front, forward, backward now. I can read. Okay, thanks. Uh, this actually was a practical thing which I had done for the monitor mixing setup uh, with the console and everything, where I had uh, shown how various musicians like their mixes uh, and how each uh, musician has their own preference regarding to what they want in their mixes but that's not we don't unfortunately that's not possible now but what i would like to say is ki uh, for sel for quite a while i think for a good 5 5 to 6 years when i was doing monitors I had gone from FOH to monitors and now I'm back to FOH. Uh, the thing is, our job as a monitor engineer is to make sure that the musician or the artist, the singer is comfortable on stage and therefore he is able to uh, give his optimal output and sing better and perform better. So when I was doing monitors, pure monitors now, uh, we first of all we switched to stereo for all the musicians. Uh, the reason for switching to stereo was not because ah stereo for the chair. It's because placement of instruments could be done in a better fashion. Uh, like even say with a drum kit where you have like a kick snare, three toms, hi hats, uh, and everything is pounding in the center. Uh, when you do a stereo, you can you know say pan the toms away, overheads even more away. Uh, therefore creating a little bit of space in the middle for that person's voice or for that person's uh, uh, instrument. So what we used to do was we would say if it was a dholak player, I actually would not pan the dholak baya chati. Dholak baya chati would remain in the center. But everybody else would get panned. Like the congas would get panned, the drums would get panned, the keyboards would get panned. But his dholak would remain in the center so that when he plays, he's got a good, uh, you know, good enough reference and a good enough thing about his dholak. And everything else is panned to the sides so he can hear them, but it doesn't interfere with his thing. With the singers, a lot of these singers, they keep pulling one ear out, which actually is wrong and that should not happen because the moment he pull, pulls one ear out, the volume in the other, other ear doubles by 6 dB, as we all know. 6 dB means 100% increase of volume. So that's what happens because he pulls one ear out, now load is only on one side, 50%. So that volume needs to go up by 6 dB, which actually is detrimental to that particular singer or musician's uh, ear health. That's wrong. But unfortunately, they do that. They keep pulling one ear out. So for singers, uh, I would not pan so much because if I started panning, uh, drums and dholes and you know dholaks full left right and if he's pulled one ear out now he's not say with depending on which ear he's now missing the chati or if the keyboard is playing like an arpeggiated pattern which is going from left to right he's missing half of it you know he's not hearing the full thing so for them for the singers we would keep the pans a little in uh, so that even if he pulls one ear out he's at least getting a little bit of a reference of what the mix should sound like uh, again, for the singers, for each singer, individual singer, uh, if there were three singers on stage, of all three, we would have three different reverbs because nobody really likes when the other person singing is their reverb wash going on in their ears. So, and if we ran out of auxes, then we used to use them in insert mode. You can you can use uh, reverbs plugins. I I'm actually more of an avid uh, mixing console guy. So I can only tell you from that reference point. Uh, what you can do is you can put reverbs in an insert mode because the plugins themselves ha also have a wet dry balance. So you can use that wet dry balance to adjust the amount of reverb. Don't 
uh, of course, don't send so much that you know the singer swimming in it, but uh, do send them a little bit because it sort of helps them because if they are totally enclosed in their in-ears and you send them like a very dry uh, basic mix of nothing, like no processing or anything, it really doesn't sound so good. I mean, when we all hear music, uh, even outside, say, we hear any song on our phones, outside, on headphones and all, we know how nicely processed those songs are, you know, how nicely the reverbs sit and everything, and it helps, and you like that song. And so the same thing happens with musicians and singers. If you, and I'm not saying judicially, sparingly process and everything, but enough to make sure that the mix sounds nice, you know, it sort of helps them to perform better. The third thing we used to do for, uh, uh, for SEL was, uh, actually we never, we, like, we wouldn't use drum shield, like I said in the beginning, we should use maybe drum shields and uh, dhol shields and conga shields and all, but they actually don't like using shields, they would just, uh, they would like, nay, 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 I cannot hear the drums and all, but uh, outside or what, I, what used to happen is we used to get a lot of wash of the cymbals in the singer's mics. And at any given time when the singer singing like this and then he does this and the drums are right behind, it's just. So we used to use a lot of DSRs on the singers, but the DSRs were set very high to say around 8K, 10K range. So those DSRs were only put on their voices to pull the cymbals out of, their, out of that signal, not to DS the singer themselves. So what it would do is every time the drummer would hit a crash or a splash, it would just suck it down and then come back up. That was the third thing we used to do. Uh, do I remember anything else? Yeah, so for particular songs, uh, if you're familiar with the SEL um, discography, we had a couple of songs like Dil Chata Hai and Kalona Ho, uh, where even for monitors, uh, and actually it's, this is a very subjective thing uh, or it's a very uh, simple thing. I don't know why we don't do it for monitors, but we should. I only do it for FH, which is double patching channels. So what we would do was we would double patch, uh, say, Loy's uh, piano, because for, say, Kalona, he would like his, uh, when he was playing the solo and the intro and everything, he would keep telling me, my, because he was the only, only person on stage, there was no one else. So he would keep telling me, my keyboard is too loud in mirrors, my keyboard is too loud. So if I, if I drop the main fader down, which means everybody, the keyboard goes down in everybody's ears. And so that definitely was not, you know, then the musicians would complain saying, Ke, are, I, we can't hear him. So we double patched uh, Loy's, uh, just that keyboard channel where he would play the piano. And what was set, sent only to Loy and the rest was sent to the musicians. So then, of course, then when we just dropped Loy's channel, that's what dropped and nothing else. Everybody else's uh, keyboards remain the same. Uh, we used to do the same thing for uh, Dil Chata Hai for uh, Ehsan's guitar. We used to double patch Ehsan's guitar because when he starts playing the solo, the initial part, Again, all the instruments under him drop down. There's just like a simple shaker going on and stuff like that. And he would, he would also be complaining, oh, I'm a guitar's too loud in my ears and all. So we did the same thing for him. We double patched his channel and uh, we would bring it down and then halfway through the solo, when the drums and all started kicking back in, we would uh, slowly bring uh, back his guitar up to the level. We'll, uh, let's... Okay, so this actually is what I, this is, I mean, I'm still doing this, where I'm mixing monitors from front of house. Luckily for me, this is a very small band, so they don't really require a dedicated monitor engineer, and I am able to mix monitors from front of house. So here, I'm not just catering to the audience, where I'm setting up a front of house mix, I'm also setting up another five mixes, which go back up on stage, which is uh, the singer, keyboard, drums, bass, and guitar. And of course, each individual person has their own choice of their own balance and everything. And uh, so what I have done here is now, I mean, with the digital consoles, we get big enough digital consoles, which do 64 channels and you know 70. So 
Here, I have actually double patched quite a bit. I have actually triple patched some stuff in this. So basically, uh, stuff, critical channels get double patched, so like say kick, snare, and then guitars. Uh, all the three, all the two, two of the keyboards, uh, not the sampler. And uh, of course, KK's voice and uh, bass. Bass also gets double patched because the bassist wants it. Now, the reason for doing this is because when I'm mixing front of house, I may like to process uh, a particular channel like a kick or something. That day I may, and it also is PA dependent. You know, it's not just room, it's room dependent, area dependent, PA dependent, uh, uh, mic dependent. So I may have like a beta 52 one day, I may have a Sennheiser, whatever is, you know, that E600 or whatever the hell it's called, or I may have an Audix D6, or I may have some different mic on a particular day. And I'm, and depending on the PA and the room and all, I may want to EQ the kick in a particular manner, but which when going back to the headphones of the musicians, they don't like it. They were like, no, 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 this has too much low end, or this does not have any low end, or this is too clicky, and it's not clicky enough, and what's going on? So what you do is you double patch it. So you have one channel where you mix, which is your front of house channel, and you mix that for yourself. And you have another channel which is going back only to the musicians. Now, we complicate this further. We triple patch stuff. So what happens is now with guitars, uh, and this is something which is true for myself, so it's not that I'm dissing him. It happens, it's happened to me also. We've all now crossed 50, and we're all losing our hearing now. And so what's happening is me and him, both of us, are getting a nice 5K, 6K, bump because on the top end is rolling off, right, for our hearing. So therefore, we have become, our ears have become like JBL wedges now. So <laughs> that little <laughs> high mid bump has happened to us, which he doesn't like. So he keeps asking me to roll that off. If I roll that off, the keyboard player who is like a 30 something and the drummer who is like a <laughs> not even hit 40 as yet complains saying, oh man, what is happening? Guitars are too muddy. It's very, you know, I can't understand what's going on. So therefore, the triple patch. <laughs> so I have one for front of house. I have one for the guitarist. And I have one for the rest of the musicians. So that's why I have triple patch. So, and it works well. What happens is initially you find it a little complex and complicated, but once you develop a routine or whatever, you know, you'll, it'll, uh, it'll be fine, it's, it's cool, it, it works fine, there's no issue as such. All clear so far, any, uh, any questions? Anybody wants to ask anything? Okay, so uh, one thing I missed, which thank you for magnifying, I just saw. So, uh, KK also likes, uh, like Shankara also likes a little bit of reverb on his voice. But KK likes a nice, nice reverb on his voice. Now, what I have done, uh, and again, I, I, I'm sure I can do this on a Digico or an Allen Heath or whatever, but since I use the Avid console a lot, I will talk from the Avid console perspective. So what I have done is uh, I have uh, set up my gain uh, on the reverb uh, return. and that reverb return is being sent back to KK at a specific level. And what I have done is uh, I have created a snapshot. And I'm, we are not going to touch on snapshots today, but snapshots, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> snapshots help you a lot actually for monitors because not just for uh, changing levels, but actually for creating mutes. It, you know, it's great if you have certain instruments uh, which are not playing in a particular song, you can create snapshots of just the mutes and nothing else, you know, and you can just keep changing snapshots and so those particular instruments just keep, stay muted in that particular song. You can use that for monitors and for front of house if you want. Okay, so coming back to this, so I created a snapshot where, uh, because as we all know that after some time mixer faders go out of alignment and you know, you think you are at zero but you are not. You, you could be at plus four and minus six for all you know, it doesn't work. But when you're doing it, via a snapshot and internally when that fader comes up, so the physical representation of the fader may be anywhere, but you do, you when you look at the software screen, you know that it has reached its correct uh, point. So I set up a snapshot where 
between songs when he's talking, I would drop the fader down, there would be no reverb or anything. And then I set up the snapshot on a macro key. And the moment he was going to or about to sing, I would press the macro key and it would bring the fader, uh, the reverb fader back up again and he would get uh, the same consistent reverb on every song in his ears. So that sort of helped, uh, helped him a lot. Like he was like, okay, this works, this is really nice. Otherwise, what happens is you, depending on how fast, slow, where you bring your fader up, he may be getting too much reverb, too less reverb. You know, it makes, a, makes quite a bit of a difference. Oh, I thought I had more to talk. Okay, some uh, alternate monitorings uh, which are very helpful. And uh, I think we've, we've been getting into it for uh, quite some time back when uh, Yamaha consoles like the M7CL and the CL5 and all, you know, they got out all their softwares and we, you could mix on and off an iPad and you could, uh, you know, set up monitors or like the Soundcraft VI consoles where they could do a lot of, uh, you know, set up all these little iPads for the musicians and uh, they could do that. Now that's become more prevalent. A lot of uh, musicians, uh, they prefer to do their own setup. So I'm not talking about the sound check. I'm talking more about the show, uh, during the show when, say, you're catering. Like now, when I was doing monitors for SEL, I was catering to, at any given time, uh, eight musicians, eight back musicians plus Esan, Loy, 9, 10, and three singers, 13. Uh, 13 to 14 people and it becomes difficult to keep swiveling your head around Achha, who wants what, Kya achha, isko ye chahiye, nahi, usko wo chahiye, you know, becomes very uh, difficult. So now a few of the musicians like the keyboard player, like the drummer, uh, they, they, are, they, they bring their iPads, we connect their iPads uh, into the system and during sound check we have control, we make sure that during sound check they are given correct levels because uh, for on the iPads and all, it's just a question of balance. You can't really EQ or uh, balance and pan. You can't really EQ or uh, compress or anything. So all that is handled during sound check. But during the show, if they suddenly find one particular instrument has become too loud and you know, and he's waving or trying to wave at you because, but at the same time he's playing, so he can't. He's just you know doing this to you. So and you're like wondering what the hell is going on. So it's much easier for him to just reach on the iPad and maybe you know pull that particular fader down a little bit. So that's become more, I think, now better because I think musicians have also become a little more tech savvy and uh, stuff like that. So alternate monitoring, mixing, basically what is the most popular is the iPad. Uh, that is what we all use quite a lot. Uh, we can even use phones. I think some mixing consoles also uh, can be loaded up on the phone. Uh, if you this is actually, uh, this is more for an install uh, and maybe more for a much bigger band who's got like a lot of tech crew traveling with them and they can rig it up. Now this is, uh, this is a Behringer but you also get like an Avion system uh, where what you do is you subgroup a uh, number of channels. Now I think it's up to 24 so you can send 24 submixes into this and uh, each and they are put at each station, each musician's station and he can control his own mix and everything. Uh, some of them also have a built-in ambience mic. So that becomes a little bit of a problem for quite a few musicians who have actually complained to me, uh, you know, that uh, we get totally cut off when we are wearing headphones. So these, some of these also have an ambience mic. So a little bit of the stage uh, what's happening on stage, stage sound leaks uh, into their ears and sort of puts them in the present, you know, there. And then they're not like sort of isolated or cut off from uh, things. Uh, alternatively, now what we do is we also set up two ambience mics. Uh, but the problem with ambience mics is that it's fixed. So if there's a singer who's like, say, walking from left to right, uh, unfortunately, he's going to hear that same fixed ambience. So if he's that side, it's not, the ambience is not going to dynamically move with him. Uh, so if some cr guy from the crowd here shouts loudly, he may be at that end, but he's going to hear it very loud, you know. So, but unfortunately, that's a bit of a catch-22 situation where the musician says, I, or singer says, like, I want a little bit of this thing, 
and you want to give that to him, but unfortunately, it also comes with its uh, limitations. Some of the smaller consoles work of Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, like the Midas or the Soundcraft, uh, where everything is app controlled. Uh, you can mix everything off an app, and therefore, you can also provide uh, the musicians their own this thing. You can also tie, you, what you can also do is if you're running a small band, a small setup, and you want to give the musicians uh, control over their own mixes, the, over their own this thing. You can actually do a, like a split uh, thing where you have your console on front of house and you have this, like a console like this on stage. Uh, and it's only, it's only, so that becomes like your monitor console, but it's remotely, con remotely controlled. You don't have an operator standing there. So, but this works very well if you've already snapshotted and, you know, show files and everything are there. So what happens is you can now mix front of house and the, and the musicians can control their own mixes from a monitor console which is remotely located. This is very prevalent in UK and US where a lot of small bands who cannot afford to travel with two engineers but can afford to travel with gear because they are traveling by road most of the times and not flying. Uh, so they carry two consoles. One console is, uh, you know, connected via iPad and everything uh, which is kept on stage and one console is with the front of house engineer and he is then not so uh, bothered or worried about, unless something drastically goes wrong about uh, the musicians' mixes, they handle the mixes on their own. Okay, I think we are done. Thank you. Any more questions? Pushna, good. Sir, uh, we are keeping, uh, nowadays we are keeping uh, monitor wages as backup, you said. So are you sending the same mix uh, as in, in here uh, to the uh, to the wages or uh, you make a, uh, you make some efforts to mix it all along? No, yeah, you're right. It's, a, it's almost the same mix. Yeah, because uh, in, in here we, uh, we are using some more lows and low mids and uh, yes but the augs is different yeah. the augs is different so, so what in calibration process you cut down that i uh, cut down on the augs yeah, on the yeah, yeah. the wedge the eq of the wedge itself yeah, yeah. so if you're sending like a lot of low end uh, i would actually suggest don't send too much low end into the headphones yeah. because they are getting enough low end from the pa anyway okay. from the pa subs so if you send too much low end in the headphones okay. Uh, it's actually going to muddy up the musician, the artist's mix. So don't send, don't do that. So that also what happens, so what will happen is actually if you play that same mix maybe on the wedge, uh, the wedge may be too top-ended. Yeah. If you take the IEM mix and play it. So, uh, so therefore you, you EQ against that on the wedge. Right. So that particular aux channel, the graphic EQ or whatever, so you can EQ. Uh, but I mostly try and send the same mix, same mix. on the, because it's it's a it's yeah, the yeah. spare, it's a safety, it's a yeah, standby. Most of the time we don't get yeah, time to yeah, mix them. Yeah. yeah, thanks. There's one at the back. Hi, sir. Uh, could you just touch upon the uh, dynamic processing on uh, like the FOH versus the monitor mix? Ah, the dynamics? Yes, good point. So uh, when I'm doing like even this, and this holds true for even monitors, I am not relying on too many plugins or I am not compressing very hard when I'm sending stuff back to the musician because one, it has to be dynamically open for the musician. So if he plays hard, it needs to come back hard to him in the years. If your compressor is too strong and if he plays hard and your compressor is sucking, it's not going to help him. He, he, he's going to think, no, actually, I don't think I'm you know, playing hard enough and he'll try to play harder and harder. So it sort of defeats the purpose. So for monitors, I, uh, what I do is, I will use very light compression, very light. In fact. Most of the times it'll be more like a limiter uh, rather than a compression, because as we all know in compressors, the uh, compressors tend to raise the noise flow rather than actually pushing anything down. Uh, so 
uh, when the compress if you've compressed too hard and when nobody's playing anything there are chances that the noise flow will come up and they'll hear more of uh, you know the uh, ground thing rather than uh, this thing as opposed to front of house front of house you can do whatever you want it's not a problem therefore the double patch so when you double patch it when you're sending stuff back uh, to the musician it's not really in a, you don't need to really compress too much you don't need to you need to eq whatever to cater to their ears rather than uh, this thing and front of house you do what you want i i hope that's yeah okay. Okay, I've been asked to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the lovely session. I now call upon Ms. Sir Smita Rai, Deputy Project Director of Palm Expo, uh, to present a small token of appreciation to Mr. Ashish Saxena. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay back for our next session by Mr. Warren D'Souza on reshaping the future of equipment rental services in India. Thank you. <laughs>